Welcome everyone. Today, settle yourselves in because this is quite um, a lengthy text with quite a lot of annotations. So we will be looking at Maya Angelou's Mom and Me and Mom. So it's an extract from an autobiography by the African-American author, poet, dancer, actress and singer Maya Angelou. Really, really, really well known um, writer fantastic figure um, in America. Unfortunately, she did pass away in 2014. Um, but what I'd like you to do is to pause to read text 2.2 um, and then we'll proceed with annotations. So just like the Oscar Wilde text, we will begin with context here because it will make the rest um, easier to follow. So this autobiography is about her reconnecting with her mum. Um, who abandoned, quite an aggressive word, but abandoned her during her childhood. And then this relationship with her mum as she got older became like a strong, vital force in her adult life. So just Maya Angelou, general context. She is a world-renowned poet, author and activist. Um, she's known for writing extensively about her life. Um, and she started with I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings in 1969, and hence the symbol of the bird in the cage. So more than 40 years later, after the abandonment, as we'll call it, she finally opened up um, about the complex relationship of her life with her mom, Vivian Baxter. Now, when she was three years old, Baxter sent her and her brother away to be raised by their grandmother in Arkansas. Now, when Angela returned to live with Baxter 10 years later, she refused to call her mother, mother, referring only to her as lady. So they had quite a strained relationship. Angela's, Angelo's, sorry, seventh autobiography, Mum and Me and Mum. This one chronicles how Lady eventually became Mum. So it goes from her referring to her as Lady um, to Vivian and then to Mum. Long journey with many bumps along the way, but it is a story of the healing power of love. But we'll look more at their relationship in a moment. So further... Um, Personal context, just to reiterate um, how significant she was in history, not just America, across the world. Um, many talents, essentially. Um, she didn't go to college, but has received more than 50 honorary degrees. She's well respected. Um, she was the first black woman director and producer for 20th Century Fox, which is a hugely big deal. And this was the second poet in history to read a poem during the presidential inauguration. She's won a Grammy for an audio recording of a poem. She met Tupac without even knowing he, uh, who he was and made him cry just by telling him he is important. Such an influential figure, such uh, a down-to-earth, loving woman. Um, Dr Angelo as well, Dr. Um, iconic and inspiring woman to many men and women of all colours and ages. Now, more kind of sad, really devastating backstory. So she did experience first-hand racial prejudices and discrimination in Arkansas. At the age of seven, during a visit with her mother, um, Angelo was raped by her mother's boyfriend. So really, really awful, awful background for her. As vengeance for this assault, Angelo's uncles killed the boyfriend. And she was so traumatised by this experience that she went mute. She stopped talking. So that was for five years during her childhood because um, she believed that her words brought on death. She was um, punishing herself. Um, obviously, such a, a big deal in her life. It was a, a massive struggle for her. Of course, it had a strain with her relationship with her mum as well. Um, not that it was her mother's fault, of course. But again, this kind of experience and that association um, was just really, really tough for her. Angelo went on to give birth to her son, her only child, um, when she was 16 and worked a number of jobs to support herself and her child. And we can see that in this extract when I believe she's 21, so it's about five years later. These events in history, culture and the art shaped her life, made her who she was and in turn helped shape her own worldview through her autobiographies, literature and activism.
So going to the mode then. So obviously this is an autobiography. Um, so it takes me about herself and her life. She does use usual conventions, quite confessional tone, reminisces, reflective, anecdotes, and that's all evident. A writer um, in an autobiography is aware of an implied audience. They know they're writing for publication. So it's not like a diary as such where that is entirely just personal and for them. Other people will be reading it. Um, it's subjective by nature. So because it, these events are just through her perspective. So obviously her mum may have a different perspective of things. Um, but this is just very personal to her. And again, just finally on this one, the purpose of this. Um, of an autobiography is to establish a relationship with the reader, very much on a personal level. Le level. Um, in this case, she is focusing on her relationship with Vivian, her mum. It explains her mum's behaviour, how her mum abandoned um, her and her brother when they were young, but then it goes on as a whole to focus on their reunion and reconciliation. And what we can see is we're looking more, you know, at the start, with a big turning point, actually, in the extract we're looking at for their relationship. So purpose then. So the purpose obviously to reflect on her own life. This would have been cathartic for her, um, but also publicising um, her struggles as a single mum, daughter, young black woman in a prejudiced society. It's encouraging those who face similar hardships and challenges in life. Don't give up, persevere and look what you can achieve because of the, the amount of successes that she had. She overcame obstacles in her life. So purpose here is quite motivational. Um, and she's doing this through showing the struggles that she went through. It's also reflecting about her career and how that progressed. And again, more specifically, to allow her to reflect on her own experiences with her mum, the reconciliation. And again, it's that whole idea of inspiring others to reconnect, to overcome life struggles um, and to grow. audience for this one then now because uh, Maya Angelou is such a, a big figure um, so fans, followers, those interested in literature, really famous novels, uh, poetry, activism etc um, so huge audience here. Um, those who obviously like autobiographies, people looking for inspiration, maybe people who feel lost um, could talk about young black women facing the same discrimination in life, single mothers, um, those who want that motivation, that support, um, and how they can cope. So it's kind of like a, a manual, I guess, as well, for how to overcome such difficult times. Now, her voice is appreciative throughout. Um, it's very humble. There's no arrogance. Yes, she's very successful, but she's still very grounded. So again, it's really talking to maybe parents out there um, and those, like I've said, who are facing challenges or have faced challenges. Topicality then, what is actually being spoken about in this extract. So it starts with her talking about the living conditions in San Francisco, where she lives with her only son, Guy Johnson. Big bulk of the text, this section, remember it's only a part of a, a very large autobiography. She's talking about the food that she eats first from her landlady and then onto the food that her mother cooked her and how special it was. No one can compare to her mother's cooking. She's in awe of it. And then as we get towards the closing sections of this extract, she starts to slowly open up about how her mum believed in her. That might have been the source for inspiration that led to her success and how this very fleeting, brief conversation with her mum saying more or less how amazing um, she thinks her daughter is could have been the star of her fantastic career. Now, I'm very aware this is probably the longest um, video we'll be going through. Lots of annotations. You may need, obviously, your additional paper, post-it notes, etc. But a really, really important text. So just get down as much as you can, please. So, starts off, by the time I was 22, I was living in San Francisco. Five-year-old son, two jobs, two rented rooms with cooking privileges down the hall. My landlady, Mrs. Jefferson, kind and grandmotherly. She was a ready babysitter and insisted on providing dinner for her tenants. So if we just start off here with a very clear listing, it's very impressive. Um, it shows how self-reliant and independent she is. Five-year-old son, 
two jobs, two rented rooms. It wasn't easy, but it already from the start shows her determination and strength in the face of adversity and difficult times. Then when we talk about her relationship with her landlady, so you've got your adjective grandmotherly. So she refers to kind of that figure. It's, it's a landlady, but that nice relationship she has with her. So it's connoting, you know, grandmotherly warmth. It's that sense of nurturing. And I've just said you could argue there's a tone of longing here because she has had a difficult past. She hasn't always had these, these figures in her life, these supporting figures. So it shows how much she appreciates even her landlady for the warmth she gives her. So it's like her landlady has been maybe more of a mother figure than her actual mum, Vivian, at this point. So then she goes on to say her ways were so tender, her personality so sweet that no one was mean enough to discourage her disastrous culinary exploits. So essentially you're saying here, you know, that she's such a lovely person, but her food wasn't very nice. So you've got your intense fire so before sweet, so sweet, basically how in awe and appreciative she is of her. And it's quite lighthearted. It's comical. She's not saying this to be, you know, offensive or she was an awful cook, but just shows how appreciative she was of um, her efforts. Then goes on to say spaghetti at her table, which was offered at least three times a week, was a mysterious red, white and brown concoction. So again, this mysterious red, white and brown concoction, you've got your tridic list of your colours there, um, alongside the ambiguous language, it's mysterious, it's a concoction. It's very vivid, it's very specific detail, you know, we can picture it clearly. So it shows that even though she's not enjoying this food, it's quite odd, a bit comical, she was still so appreciative of the attempts, you know, that that Miss Jefferson went through to look after her. You know, um, yes, this may not be the nicest food, but she remembers it so well and so fondly. So it then says we would occasionally encounter an unidentifiable piece of meat hidden among the pasta. There was no money in my budget for restaurant food. So very clearly here and throughout at times, we've got a bit of a semantic field of poverty. She doesn't have money. Um, so again, it just makes it seem even more important that there is this landlady looking after her. Um, but it does contribute towards the, the struggles that she faced at that time. It wasn't easy for her. So yes, she's independent, um, but she is struggling financially. And then it goes on to say, so I and my son Guy were always loyal, if not, um, sorry, if often unhappy diners at Shea Jefferson. So you've got the juxtaposition here between loyal and unhappy, these adjectives, showing kind of the sense of entrapment. She hasn't got another choice. She can't go and to eat elsewhere. She kind of relied upon the kindness of strangers here. Excuse the Blanche quote. Um, but she's appreciative of it. She hasn't got an option. But it's, again, comedic. It's not too, too downtrodden here. You know, she refers to it as Shay Jefferson, kind of like mocking that it's like a restaurant, a posh restaurant. Kind of a bit of irony there because obviously it wasn't, but again, she made the best of a bad situation. Now, in contrast to that, she then says, My mother had moved into another large Victorian house on Fulton Street, which she again filled with Gothic, heavily carved furniture. Now, just looking at that in comparison to what has just been described, you've got the clear antithesis here. It's very striking between the life that Angela herself is living and the life of her mum. So you could say it's talking about maybe their differences, the conflicts that has built their relationship, that has hinged it, and how they lead very different lives. You could also talk there where it says another large Victorian house, more or less saying that, you know, her mum has wealth. It's not the first big house that she has. Meanwhile, Angelo is, you know, trying to make ends meet, um, in a rundown kind of place. But, you know, it goes on to more or less say that, you know, Angelo's doing this because she was so independent. She wanted to do it on her own because that's what she's had to do th throughout her whole life. Um, then goes on to add to this sense of wealth of her mother when she says that she had a living employee, Papa, who cleaned the house and sometimes filled in as cook helper. So this is an anaphoric reference back to, you know, the experience that she had with Mrs. Jefferson. You know, you can see how different their experiences are. You know, her mum has a living employee um, to cook for them. Meanwhile, um, Angelo's having to rely upon, again, Mrs Jefferson and the kindness of other people. So 
So moving on then, mother picked up Guy twice a week and took him to a house where she fed him peaches and cream and hot dogs. But I only went to Fulton Street once a month and at an agreed upon time. So here we've got this reference to, you know, the mum looking after Angelo's child Guy twice a week. So we call twice a week diexis, but just more specifically temporal diexis. So it's really about time, this specific type of diexis. Now, here, it's, a, it's shown that, you know, her mum has got a strong relationship um, with her grandson. However, in, in, you know, juxtaposition with that, I guess, Angelo herself only sees her at an agreed upon time once a month. So it shows that there's still this distance between them. And the fact that she only sees her at an agreed upon time, she only sees her mum at that time, um, it's more regimented. It's less natural. It's not as kind of, um, it's not a fluid kind of spontaneous relationship they have to meet at agreed upon time so it's shown that there's still that distance between them there then we have um the proper noun here fulton street now i've just said here you know it's obviously common for autobiographies to include proper nouns because you've got to be able to create a sense of place where are they talking about? And um, readers might might go off and you know Google Fulton Street now, for example, to see the kind of place it was. However, here the way that Angelo talks about it, it's like she's detached from this place. She doesn't call it like oh my mum's home, um, my my home, etc., or my other home. No, she literally refers to it at, as Fulton Street. So it shows that distance she has. She doesn't feel a connection, a relationship with her mum's home, and symbolically maybe her mum at this point. Right. Um, she understood and encouraged my self-reliance and I looked forward eagerly to our standing appointment. So, understood and encouraged my self-reliance. So you've got your mental verb processes, understood and encouraged there. So it's shown that, you know, her mum agreed with the way of life she wanted to lead um, because obviously she grew up on her own, more or less, um, had a horrible upbringing. She's learned to depend solely on herself, be self-reliant. And her mum understands that. Okay, so there's no conflict there as such. You know, it's Angelo's choice herself that she is so independent because that's what she's had to depend upon. However, you've got that tone there where it says our standing appointment. It's quite clinical sounding, isn't it? You know, it contributes towards the distance that is there. It's like they meet upon appointment. So showing that, you know, there is they, they talk now, which they didn't for a, for a while. It's still quite clinical. Then she says, on the occasion, she would cook one of my favourite dishes. One lunch date stands out in my mind. I call it Vivian's Red Rice Day. Now, this is the intro to this whole more or less section of the autobiography. This day she talks about which changed everything for her and their relationship. So it says there, um, I call it Vivian's Red Rice Day. So you've got your alliterative proper nouns, red rice. And she's turned this day into a proper noun as if it's an event, like a bank holiday. So she's talking about this particular lunch. She appropriately names it Vivian's Red Rice Day to emphasise the significance of this particular moment. It gives this day status and power. So we know this is going to be a big deal. Yes, because she loved the food, but also for what happens later on. When I arrived at the Fulton Street house, my mother was dressed beautifully. Her makeup was perfect and she wore good jewellery. So to clarify the sentence there, it's pretty simple, but it's just, that's it, it's that tone of simplicity. She's admiring her mother's presence and physical appearance, you know. There's no bad blood in this sense. She's saying that my mum, you know, is perfect in the way that she presents herself. Then she says, after we embraced, I washed my hands and we walked through her formal dark dining room and into the large, bright kitchen. So this is quite interesting because we've got the juxtaposing imagery. So... You've got the idea that, you know, it's through food in this instance that her and her mum have a fond memory. The dark dining room, you know, you'd expect a dining room to be a place of joy and celebration, etc. But it's not. They walk through that and into a large, bright kitchen. So that is where the warmth is. That is where the connection is. That is where they have a fantastic time and they, and they, they learn to grow together. So basically just saying that, you know, it's the kitchen, this moment, the food, which is really reinforcing that, that this is the place where their relationship grows. 
Also, just a side note at the bottom there, you've got your verb embraced. So after we embrace, show that there is warmth and harmony in their relationship too. Much of lunch was already on the kitchen table. So adverb already, it shows that the effort the mum has went into when preparing this meal. So it was already on the table. She's been preparing it. Um, so again, it shows maybe the care that went into this. It is special for her too, despite them having this clinical relationship at the minute. However, you know, in alternative interpretations, um, you could say that maybe that's a bit too quick. There's that immediacy that the food is on the table. You know, we eat, we go. So it's not like there's this time for casual conversation, phatic exchanges I've put. It seems quite quick. Um, so again, you could talk about there, yes, the woman's prepared it, but maybe it seems a little bit too quick um, that they haven't got time just to, to speak, you know, to sit down on the sofa and to have a conversation. And then we have Vivian Baxter was very serious about her delicious meals. Now, another anaphoric reference here back to the start, you know, her landlady was grandmotherly, um, even though she cooked horrible meals, no, she still appreciated it. Um, but here she's talking about her mum through the proper noun, Vivian Baxter. So again, showing how complex their relationship was. You could refer it back to the time where she called her mum lady and not mum. So again, you can still see that distance here, can't you? Um, as opposed to her landlady, who's grandmotherly, and then her mum, Vivian Baxter. On that long ago red rice day, my mother had offered me a crispy dry roasted capon capon, no dressing or gravy, and a simple lettuce salad, no tomatoes or cucumbers. So here, you've got that nice repetition of red rice day. It's very nostalgic, reflective, again, really reinforcing the significance of this particular meal, this moment and the day and the conversation that comes later. And then here, obviously, you've got that semantic field of food. Um, you know, at this point, it's nothing exciting. It's nothing special. She seems a bit underwhelmed um, by this kind of bland food at this point. But then that makes the next bit more significant where the red rice is revealed and, and she loves it. So I've just said that it could symbolise their relationship, you know, a bit, bit difficult, a bit bland, not much there to start with. But as it goes on, it grows and it becomes something special. She fervently blessed the food with a brief prayer and put her left hand on the platter and her right on the bowl. She turned the dishes over and gently loosened the bowl from its contents and revealed a tall mound of glistening red rice. So we've got revealed a tall mound of glistening red rice, hyperbole. Um, it's quite exaggerated language here, isn't it? But it just shows the sense of awe that Angelo is upon this dramatic reveal of this red rice. Again, just kind of going back to the fact that this is such an important day and glistening. Think of the positive connotations of that. It's almost like a jewel um, and just how special and excited she is for this, which is reinforced then through the parenthesis, my favourite food in the entire world. So you've got this side note here um, showing that this food is for her heart as well. It's my favourite food in the entire world. Her mum has cooked it. Um, so it just shows how special this moment is for her. Also, you know, people might disagree, but I think the tone of this, my favourite food in the entire world, could say it sounds a bit colloquial and almost a bit childlike. It sounds like something a child might say. But again, reflecting back on, you know, the childhood she had, you know, she didn't have the childhood she, well, anyone deserved. Um, so it's maybe why this particular meal, this moment is so special to her. OK, we then have the chicken and salad do not feature so prominently in my taste buds memory that each grain of red rice is emblazoned on the surface of my tongue forever. So here you've got very clear, vivid sensory language, haven't you? It's very clear, hyperbolic, of course, but it's shown how intense these flavours are. And more significantly, how she remembers every teeny detail of this interaction. Contextually then as well, just linking back to the, um, the start with, you know, the concoction of food that the landlady would make her. It's obviously a much welcome change. It shows how much she appreciates this experience.
Gluttonous and greedy negatively describes the heart eater offered the seduction of her favourite food. Two large portions of rice sated my appetite, but the deliciousness of the dish made me long for a larger stomach so I could eat two more helpings. It's quite comical. You've got your comparative larger there, wanting a larger stomach so she can eat more. She wants this experience to last. She wants more food because it's so fantastic and special for her. But I have added just on top of that, it's symbolic of her longing for this particular moment, this particular day with her mother to last just a little bit longer. My mother had plans for the rest of her afternoon, so she gathered her wraps and we left the house together. We reached the middle of the block and were enveloped in the stinging acid aroma of vinegar, um, vinegar sorry, um, from the pickle factory of the corner of Fillmore and Fulton Streets. I had walked ahead. My mother stopped me and said, baby. Right, so this is where the, the shift really happens here, isn't it? Um, so you've got, we left the house together, semantic field of unity, You've got your plural pronoun we, adjective together, but it's showing, you know, them as a unit, which is very special. It's a very poignant moment in their relationship. And that becomes more clear where my mother stopped me and said, baby. Now, colloquial dialogue. So what she does now, she starts inserting, you know, explicit speech of the conversation she's about to have. And the fact that she calls her baby as well. It's that endearment from a mother. It's something quite close. Um, which might be unexpected considering the, the path that they've had, but it shows their relationship growing. And also it just arrives quite abruptly. It comes out of nowhere. This this exchange that's about to happen, it wasn't built up to. The mum literally just stops her, says baby, um, and then this kind of a range of compliments comes out. I walked back to her. Baby, I've been thinking, and now I am sure, you are the greatest woman I've ever met. I looked down at the pretty little woman with her perfect makeup and diamond earrings and a silver fox scarf. She was admired by most people in San Francisco's black community, and even some whites liked her and respected her. So you've got here, you are the greatest woman I've ever met. So this is the mum saying this to Maya Angelou. It's got your superlative greatest, huge shift in tone here. So it's not about food anymore. It's about their relationship. And the fact that she says the greatest woman I've ever met, it shows the pride she feels for her daughter. You know, the resilience, the fact that she's been able to survive on her own and the battles that she's overcome. So it shows the pride that, you know, her mum feels. We've then got at the end here, um, it kind of contextualises how important this, this is coming from her mum. So she was admired by most people. And then it says, um, liked and respected. So you've got loads of mental verb processes, processes here, which are very complementary. And it's basically saying that her mum has met a lot of people, is respected by a lot of people. So for her mum to say that, you know, Maya Angelou is the greatest woman is a big deal for her. Um, even though you'd expect a parent to say that to the child, you know, you would expect that. In their case, not so much because of the past that they have had. So for the mother... Um, to make this admission is of the highest value because of her own status and the respect that she has earned. And even from the white community during a time of greater white supremacy and prejudice, etc. So the fact that they put that in there, it's kind of the putting the underlying issues of kind of um, racial discrimination, obviously still an issue today. Um, but back then, even more so, you could argue. She continued, um, you are very kind and very intelligent, and those elements are not always found together. Mrs. Ellen Roosevelt, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, and my mother, yes, you belong in that category. Here, give me a kiss. So here at the start, we've got you are very kind and very intelligent. So you've got the repetition of the intensifier very. So Vivian goes on here to explore the, explore the specific qualities she admires about her daughter. It's like she's in awe of her and the fact that she's kind and intelligent, she's basically saying they don't come often together. So it's the sense of pride she feels. Now, more interestingly, actually, when she starts referring to Eleanor Roosevelt and Dr. Mary and her mum, so you've got Trydick List there. She makes this comparison um, with her daughter to three other strong women in her life. 
So let's just establish. Obviously, her mother is going to be important to her, to Vivian. Roosevelt was the first lady of the US. And Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune was an American educator, stateswoman, philanthropist, humanitarian, womanist, civil rights activist. Um, she was black as well. So that was, that's a nice comparison there. The power, you know, and the power that Maya Angelou would go on to have for the black community um, in later years as well. So just with that, then these figures and being compared to them is so it's such a big deal for Maya Angelou. There's a clear sense of dramatic irony for us, though, because we do know that Angelo goes on to become this huge figure within American history, um, an icon for black rights, for activism. Um, so, again, this obviously happened before Maya Angelou was, you know, famous and was big in society. But we're just seeing here that, you know, it's her mum that identified that potentially that Maya Angelou had the potential, which makes it so special for her. She kissed me on the lips and turned, and Jay walked across the street to her beige and brown Pontiac. So, synthetic list in here. What this does, the way that they depart, it's not a big dramatic exit. It's very informal. You now, the mum just Jay walks. That's like crossing illegally on a street in America. You have to use, like, you know, the walks, the paths, etc. Um, but it just makes it all seem very casual, which means it was quite honest. It was quite... Um, there was a sense of integrity, integrity, sorry, and authenticity to to what her mum has just said. It wasn't this big dramatic rehearsed speech. It was on the street, very casual, and then she just wanders off. And it makes it even more special for Maya Angelou. And that's clear where it says, I pulled myself together. She moves on very quickly from this. She doesn't talk too much about her, you know, immediate reaction to her mum saying this to her. It's just through a kind of casual idiom. So she pulled herself together, but it shows how bewildered and taken, you know, took off guard that Angelo was after this exchange. You know, they've had a tumultuous past. It's been rocky. It's been up and down. But this recognition is obviously of great importance to her. And for her mum to say that to her, it's really important. And now, as a reader, we can truly understand the significance of Vivian's Red Rice Day. It's not just because of Red Rice. It was this substantially important moment in their relationship. My policy of independence would not allow me to accept money or even a ride from my mother, but I welcomed her and her wisdom. Now I thought of what she had said. I thought, suppose she is right. So if you just go here, my policy of independence would not allow me to accept money. So we've got your noun policy here, and again, it's very clinical again by policy, it's like business language, but she still wants to maintain this sense of independence. She's been through so much, she welcomes this exchange, and it's really important to her, but she does want to reaffirm that she will only rely upon herself. And then we have that rhetorical question, so suppose she is right. So you've got your rhetorical question there, it's this internal dialogue she's having with herself, this reflection, and obviously that's the purpose of an autobiography, and she's gained this sense of self-worth from this very small exchange with her mum. You know, it's really, really brief, but you could say this is the catalyst for her future successes and actions. Perhaps this conversation and the belief her mum has put in her was one of the reasons why she went on to become, as it says at the end there, become somebody. Then as we come to a close, at that moment, when I could still taste the red rice, I decided the time had come to stop my dangerous habits like smoking, drinking and cursing. Imagine I might really become somebody someday. So here we have her stopping her dangerous habits. We tried it list, smoking, drinking, cursing. And it just marks a clear shift in her attitudes towards life. And yeah, I've, I've put there, importantly, herself. You know, she knows she can do good. She needs to look after herself if she can help other people, which she did go on to do, she was outstanding. So she aims to better herself and to become the person she wants to be. And all it took was that little nudge from her mum and that respect from her mum for her to kind of reflect and change her attitude towards life. Then we have, imagine I might really become somebody someday. So you've got that dramatic irony again here, because we know that she does become somebody. I mean, she was somebody anyway. She's a fantastic, brave woman. But then in the public eye, she became somebody really significant. So the reader will understand Angelo's contributions to the world, her activism, literature, 
thousands of other works. Um, and once again, it reinforces the purpose of this text. You know, this memory is more than a simple meal. It is a turning point in her life. You know, this is where she realised that she can be somebody and she can make a difference. So quite a lot there. Um, just to get the whole idea is just just think of it structurally. We've got the start. We understand kind of the struggle that she's going through. Then we understand maybe the complexities of her relationship with her mum. And her voice is a bit, you know, it's not very direct there. It's more about food. But then as we get to the close and we see this exchange between her and her mum, we understand the purpose of this text, how this special Vivian's Red Rice Day is more than food. It was a turning point in their relationship, but also Maya Angelou's career and the work she'd go on to do, which helped hundreds of thousands, potentially even millions of people in the future. So in regards to the question, um, so how does Angelou create a sense of voice when reflecting on her experiences? As for the question that you would, um, the text will compare this to, it is one provided by the exam board. This is one of the first examples they gave us. So please um, spend some time and then we'll go through and reflect on this after you've written your first response. 